translation in purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada. Shonaka said, O Sutta Goswami, you are the most fortunate and respected of those who can speak and recite. Please relate the pious message of Srimad Bhagavatam, which was spoken by the great and powerful sage Sukadeva Goswami. Purport. Sutta Goswami is twice addressed herein by Shonaka Goswami. Out of great joy, because he and the members of the assembly were eager to hear the text of Bhagavatam uttered by Sukadeva Goswami. They were not interested in hearing it from a bogus person who would interpret in his own way to suit his own purpose. Generally, the so-called Bhagavatam reciters are either professional readers or so-called learned impersonalists who cannot enter into the transcendental personal activities of the Supreme Person. Such impersonalists twist some meaning out of Bhagavatam to suit and support impersonalist views and the professional readers at once go to the tenth canto to mis-explain the most confidential part of the Lord's pastimes. Neither of these reciters are bona fide persons to recite Bhagavatam. Only one who is prepared to present Bhagavatam in the light of Sukadeva Goswami and only those who are prepared to hear Sukadeva Goswami and his representative are bona fide participants in the transcendental discussion of Srimad Bhagavatam. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Vyananjana Shalakaya Chakshuran Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha What the pious message of Srimad Bhagavatam which was spoken by the great and powerful sage Sukadev Goswami. Sonakarishi, or Prabhupada calls him Sonaka Goswami here, uh, is the leader of the sages who have gathered in the Naimisharanya forest. Naimisharanya is at the center, it's like at the hub of the universe. And for thousands of years, for yugas, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, Naimisharanya <coughs> has been a holy place. It's a place of sacrifice. Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada established one temple there. And of course even before that it was the residence of many great sages. Even today if you go there to Naimisharanya you'll see people come there and they will do head shaving, they will receive their sacred thread, they will do different rituals and Vedic sacrifices there. So Sonika Rishi was the head of the sages and he, was, he had been elected by the sages to put their questions <coughs> to Sutta Goswami. And Sonika Rishi is, uh, of, he speaks often very powerfully. He's a very uh, learned person and he's very convinced in the authority of Srimad Bhagavatam as we can hear from the sloka, he understands the nature of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So the, he calls it the, the pious Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavatim Punyam. Huh? The, the pious Srimad Bhagavatam. Because the nature of this Bhagavatam is, well, it's not just giving us ordinary material piety, but it's giving us the asset of entering into spiritual trans spiritual affairs. There are different levels of pious activities. We can perform pious activities which will give us material prosperity, material comforts. And we can perform pious activities which will qualify us for liberation. But hearing Srimad Bhagavatam 
hearing it from the proper source qualifies us for devotional service. Gives us the opportunity to actually take up devotional service. This is mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, Yesham Twantagatam Papam Jananam Punya Karmanam. Tidanva moha nirmukta vajantimam dradavrita. Lord Krishna is describing qu the qualification to take up bhakti yoga. He said, persons who have acted piously in previous lives and in this life and are freed from the reactions of sin, then they engage themselves in my service with determination. So we may wonder, how is it we could come to Krishna consciousness if such qualifications are required? Did I perform any pious activities to justify this? I, I did a lot of sins probably, previous lives. By nature I am sinful. But somehow I have the opportunity to take up devotional service. What was my qualification? What was the qualification? That somehow we got the qualification to take up devotional service by serving great souls, by serving devotees. It said, Mahatsevam Dwara Mahur Vimuktis. By serving the devotees, it opens the doors to liberation. So, hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam, is another way in which we can also serve the great souls. There is the book Bhagavatam and the person Bhagavatam. If we do service for the person Bhagavat, it opens the doors to liberation. And if we serve the book Bhagavatam also, it has the same effect as serving the person Bhagavatam. Service to the book Bhagavatam is done by hearing properly. We said, it's mentioned here, that we must hear from the right source. A number of people take advantage of the Srimad Bhagavatam to speak their own interpretations of the Bhagavatam. Just as Bhagavad Gita is commonly spoken about, and often abused by many people, they will take the message of the Gita and put their own interpretation into it. Especially, we see in India, politicians, they will they understand that the Bhagavad Gita is respected by the mass of people, and they will talk about Bhagavad Gita, but they will put their own political message into the Bhagavad Gita. And Srila Prabhupada also told us he said that actually Mahatma Gandhi did the same thing. Although Srila Prabhupada himself, before meeting his spiritual master, had been a follower of Gandhi, later on he understood that Gandhi had misinterpreted the Bhagavad Gita because he was saying the Bhagavad Gita is teaching nonviolence. He was preaching about nonviolence. But we know Bhagavad Gita is spoken on the battlefield. So, how can it be non-violence? Krishna is not preaching non-violence. Krishna was encouraging Arjuna to act. So in this way people misinterpret the scriptures. And similar pe similarly people take Srimad Bhagavatam. And they will give it their own speculative interpretations. Srila Prabhupada also describes there's a class of people who will take Srimad Bhagavatam and they will immediately go to the 10th canto and they will speak about the very intimate, confidential pastimes of Lord Krishna with his rest with the gopis of Vrindavan. Now this is a very confidential subject matter and it is not meant for discussion in public. Lord Chaitanya, while being a great devotee of Krishna, only spoke about philosophy with very few people. And when it came to discussion on the confidential subject matters of Lord Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu discussed these things with only three persons. There were only three and a half, actually. 
said in Chaitanya Charitamrita described as three and a half, because one was a woman. There was Swarup Damodar Goswami, there was Ramananda Rai, and Siki Mahiti. Siki Mahiti. And Siki, the, the lady was Siki Mahiti's sister, who was a very elderly lady, but a very great devotee. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted her as one of his intimate uh, devotees, and he would discuss topics of Lord Krishna with these people. But we see, when he met with uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, he didn't talk about these things. When he met Prakasananda Saraswati, also Mayavadi Sanyasi, he didn't talk about these things. With the other devotees, it was more kirtan, sankirtan. And in that way, everyone will become purified by the chanting of the Holy Name. But discussing on the topics of Lord Krishna, particularly the confidential pastimes of Lord Krishna, that is not for everyone to hear. One has to be qualified. Right. We see even in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in reading Srimad Bhagavatam, it's mentioned in the second canto that if one is still I, has the desire for sense gratification, in this material world, he shouldn't go beyond the second canto. We should make a thorough study of the first two cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam and become relieved of all desires for sense gratification. Then we can go to higher cantos. In a similar manner, when we worship the Lord, when we begin our worship, we first of all offer the articles. This morning we were offering articles to the Lord, and we begin by worship of His lotus feet. We first worship the lotus feet of the Lord, and then we can progress to the other limbs of the body of the Lord, and finally we come to the face of the Lord. So similarly, Srimad Bhagavatam is like that. It is a representation of the different limbs of the body of the Supreme Lord Krishna. The first two cantos represent the Pada Padma, the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. And the tenth canto is like the face of the Lord. <coughs> when we go for darshan of the deities, we follow similar procedures. We look first at towards the feet of the Lord, and gradually we look up towards his face. Queen Kunti, being the aunt of Lord Krishna, she did not like to embarrass Lord Krishna by looking on his lotus feet, so she would begin her darshan of Krishna from the, the thighs, and then this way look up. But uh, that's special set circumstance. So, Srila Prabhupada is describing to us here how we have to be very careful where we hear the message of Lord Krishna from and who we hear from. In the, for this first chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the first canto, uh, Prabhupada elaborate, elaborates on the qualifications of the speaker of Srimad Bhagavatam and of the audience. Because just as the speaker has to be qualified, the audience also has to be qualified. One may be a very expert teacher, but if the student is not qualified, it doesn't matter how good the teacher is, the, the te it will be difficult to uh, to really develop the student. There has to be the qualifications on both sides. Therefore, Lord Krishna accepted Arjuna as his student. Lord Krishna didn't pick just anyone to speak the Bhagavad Gita to. In fact, Srila Prabhupada tells us wherever Lord Krishna goes, Arjuna goes with him so that he can speak Bhagavad Gita. What was Arjuna's special qualification? Because you're my devotee as well as my friend. And then in the ninth 
chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives us another qualification of Arjuna. That because you are never envious of me, Arjuna, therefore I am speaking this confidential knowledge to you. And similarly, uh, Sutta Goswami is equally qualified. As mentioned here in this verse, what, what is his qualification? That he is, uh, it's mentioned, uh, you are most, you are respected, you, do, you are most fortunate and respected of those who can speak and recite. So, how, do, how, how is it he is qualified to speak and recite? He had heard, that was one qualification, he had heard Sukadeva Goswami speak. When Sukadeva Goswami spoke, the Srimad Bhagavatam to Maharaj Parikshit, at that time Sutta Goswami was also there. And he, he heard Srimad Bhagavatam from Shukadeva Goswami. And so that is one qualification. Uh, another qualification is that he has the blessings of Lord Balaram. Because Lord Balaram had killed the father of Sutta Goswami. Uh, the father of Sutta Goswami was Romaharshan Sutta. And Romaharshan Sutta had been, he, he, he was a disciple of Vyasadev, and he had been uh, selected by the sages to guide them in preparation for the oncoming Kali Yuga. The sages in Naimisharanya had gathered there in Naimisharanya because he understood that the Kali Yuga was beginning. And with the age of Kali, it's a, a, an age of irreligion. It's an age in which people are misguided and unlucky and always disturbed. And we have also a short life. We're not very well qualified. So the sages of Naimisharanya wanted to benefit the people of Kali Yuga. And they came to this forest of Naimisharanya to perform sacrifice for their benefit. And uh, Romaharshan was originally speaking to the sages there in Naimisharanya. And that time Lord Balaram came. Lord Balaram should have been in the battle of Kurukshetra, but he didn't want to take part in any battle because he had friendship with both sides. Duryodhan was his friend and his student, and the Pandavas were also his friends and students. So Lord Balaram said he would not take part in the battle of Kurukshetra. And at that time, he went on pilgrimage to visit different holy places. And at a certain point, he came to the Nandasharanya forest. And all the sages were engaged in hearing Sutta Goswami, and Sutta Goswami was sitting on the elevated seat just like I am here today. And Lord Balaram came in, and when all the sages saw Lord Balaram, they all offered respects. Some bowed down, and some offered pranams, but they all honored Lord Balaram because they understood that Lord Balaram is the personality of Godhead, and they gave him respect. But Romaharshan Sutta, however, remained sitting on his elevated seat and did not honor, did not recognize Lord Balaram. So Lord Balaram considered this and he thought that his mission in coming to this world is just as Lord Krishna describes in Bhagavad Gita. Paritranaya uh, sadhunam vinaschaya chaturskrita. So Lord Balaram thought this person is actually proud. And one who is proud cannot represent Vyasadeva. He should not be sitting on that seat. So Lord Balaram took the kosha grass and pierced the heart of uh, Romaharshan Sutta. And the sages, all the assembled sages were greatly shocked to see this. And then they told Lord Balaram, they said, we had given a benediction to Romaharshan Sutta. We had benedicted him that he would have a long life. 
so that he could speak to us. He could speak all the Vedic knowledge to us. And you have killed him. So Lord Balaram said, well, if you want, I can bring him back to life. But the sages said, no, you are the Supreme Lord. We know you are the personality of Godhead. It was your decision to kill him. We don't want you to change anything. You have decided like this. But we had given a, ble a blessing that he would have a long life. So what, what about the benediction we had given him? So Lord Balaram, being a very great, being the Supreme Lord, he came with a perfect solution. He said, we can give that benediction to the Son. Because the Son is not different from the Father. If you honor the Son, it's as good as honoring the Father. So it was understood that we will give this blessing of long life to Sutta Goswami. So Sutta Goswami is described here as fortunate. He had been put in that position by Lord Balaram that he could speak the Srimad Bhagavatam for the benefit of the, the, the sages and for the benefit of all of us because we all want to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam. So, uh, Srila Prabhupada encourages us that this, this, we have to hear from the proper source. It's not enough that people are just simply speaking Bhagavad Gita or they're speaking Srimad Bhagavatam. But we have to know what is their qualification. Just like if you go to a doctor, you want to know what is his qualification? <clears throat> is he the, just a quack doctor? Is he just somebody who studied medicine on his own? Or has he actually, has he gone through a formal training under a great master? Did he attend a, a college? Did he get it, you know, did he really study it properly? What is his qualification? And so, speaking...